All right. Well, let's get into it. We've got some interesting stuff to cover today, so I'm glad that you're here. You know, we have an exam on Wednesday, so everyone starts getting serious about classes close to exam time, and that's good. Um, now, the first announcement, I wanted to remind you that homework number six is due on Wednesday at 11 a.m. So that's just, you know, immediately before our exam begins. And I know it may seem cruel and unusual for me to be giving you a homework assignment at the same time as you're uh, studying for the exam, but I just wanted to point out that the homework only has three problems. And so, you know, that's not to suggest that you should begin, uh, that you should procrastinate, but it's not an extremely lengthy assignment. All right, so uh, that homework is due at 11, and then uh, I guess, ironically, the uh, the homework is due after the exam opens because I've got the, the closing time for the homework set at 11 a.m. on Wednesday, but I'm going to make the exam begin to be available at 10.30 a.m. Now, I consider it a 45-minute exam, meaning that kind of the majority of students, I think that three-quarters of students in a normal classroom environment would be able to finish the test in 45 minutes. And some may finish as quickly as 25, and then unfortunately for a handful of students who aren't prepared and don't understand the material, even an infinite amount of time wouldn't be enough to take the test. Um, but it's going to be available for a two-hour window between 10.30 and 11, uh, 10.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. And uh, as a take-home exam, you're allowed to use your textbook. Uh, you can use the lecture notes that I've provided as long as well as any notes that you yourself have prepared and your previously solved homework problems. Um, but uh, no collaboration is allowed. So that means that you should work individually during the exam. You shouldn't contact any student and discuss with anyone the exam. Um, if you're using Excel to solve a problem, and you will, one of the problems will be uh, Excel is required. Uh, you should start with a blank workbook, and uh, I'll include that instruction on the exam just to make it explicitly clear and uh, hopefully eliminate any uncertainty. But what I mean by that is, you know, you are allowed to look at your homework, but if I'm asking you to solve something in Excel, I'm not just asking you to modify a homework problem or an in-class exercise problem. I'd like you to start from a blank, fresh workbook and uh, solve it from scratch. Um, now. You can print out the exam and solve it on your printed paper and then scan that and upload it to Blackboard. And if, if you don't have a printer, and I know that many people don't, that's okay. Just solve the exam on a blank piece of paper and then scan that. So you could have the exam up on your screen, solve it by hand on paper, uh, and then you're going to upload the PDF file and then also the Excel file for the problem that you solved with Microsoft Excel. All right. Uh, so, with that overview, are there any questions related to the exam? Harrison asks how many questions. I haven't written the test yet, and so I don't want to commit to a certain number that there's going to be. Are there other questions? You know, if, you, if something occurs to you as you... Uh, are studying for the test, feel free to send me an email or call me on Teams and I'd be happy to address any questions that you've got. Wednesday starting at 10.30, that's right. And you'll go to Blackboard to find it. So I'm not going to email the exam, you should go to Blackboard and it'll be right there on uh, front and center in our class page. Any other questions? All right, um, so today we're going to talk about annual worth analysis. And um, if you think about where we've been so far, okay, there's another question here. Will you be free to answer questions during the testing period? I'm glad you asked that. Um, you can contact me, but um, my policy during exams is that I've given you all of the information that I'm going to give you in the problem statement, and it's up to you to interpret what I mean and solve for it. And so I, I know it's possible if you want, you can always misinterpret a problem uh, a different way, but you know, um, I kind of, I, I think that uh, in engineering economy there is a uh, standard notation for how things work in like cash flow diagrams and 
So you can you can ask me a question if you like, but 99 times out of 100, the answer to any question I get during an exam is I don't have any more information to share with you. And that's not to say that I don't make mistakes, because sometimes I do. So if you think I've made a mistake in the exam, definitely reach out and, uh, and let me know. But I don't give hints during tests. So I'm pretty, uh, pretty stingy with additional information. All right, so today we're going to be talking about annual worth analysis. And um, this is just an extension of where we've already been, where we started with present worth analysis. And remember that the difference between the present worth method and present worth analysis is that in analysis, we are comparing alternatives and making a decision. And so uh, in the case of annual worth analysis, the, uh, the decision criteria that we're applying is the standard that tells us whether to choose one option or the other. And we've had decision criteria for the other um, analyses that we've done previously. In present worth analysis, the decision criteria was that we would choose the alternative that had the highest positive present worth. In future worth analysis, remember the decision criteria there is that you choose the alternative that has the highest positive future worth. So if you detect a trend here, the decision criteria for annual worth analysis is that when you express cash flows on an annual basis. And so that means you're going to be converting a cash flow diagram so that all of the amounts, whether they're future, present, or already as an annual series, you want all of those amounts to be expressed on an annual basis. And then the interest rate that you're applying is the minimum acceptable rate of return. You choose the alternative with the highest non-negative annual worth. And so there's going to be two options you'll find the annual worth of both alternatives, and then you pick the one that's most positive. So if they're both negative, then that would mean reject both alternatives and do nothing. But if one of them is positive or both of them is positive, then you choose the largest of the two. So just to visualize what an annual worth analysis looks like, here is a cash flow diagram where it looks like what we're doing is we're buying an item at year zero and then at the end of the first year there's uh, a single future worth of an outflow maybe that would be some additional maintenance or refurbishing costs and then each year of operation there is an annual cost and so that could be fuel expenses it could be a calibration or just an annual maintenance and then at the end of the cash flow diagram, it looks like this piece of equipment is being disposed of. And then we have the single uh, future value. So what annual worth analysis does is it says, let's convert everything into an annual worth that isn't already. So some of this is already expressed as an annual worth. That $0.9 million of uh, operational costs each year, that's already an annual worth. And remember, an annual worth is a continuous unbroken, meaning that there's no gap years. It's just in each period, there is either a revenue or um, a cost. So here, we want it to look like just a single string of uh, equal costs. So some of the original cash flow diagram has parts that aren't yet on an annual basis. And so, for instance, uh, we're going to convert the amount at year zero and year one and year eight into the annual worth. Um, the nice thing about this method is that if we're comparing two alternatives on an annual worth basis, then we don't have to bother with the least common multiple or early termination. Uh, the nice thing about annual worth analysis is it allows you to compare items that have a different useful life. And the reason why it's okay in the case of annual worth analysis to do that is that it's assumed when you use annual worth analysis, it's assumed that they, the items are going to be repeated. So the assumption is kind of already built in, which means that you don't have to manually make any adjustments to match up the time periods. So to turn the cash flow diagram on the left 
into the cash flow diagram on the right, we have to deal with the $8 million at the present. So think about how would you convert that amount into an annual worth? What uh, ratio would you use? You know how we sometimes talk about you're going to take an amount and then multiply it by a factor. So which factor would you multiply a present amount by to turn it into an annual? So we would want to find a given P. So you'd multiply the $8 million by the A slash P factor. Now think about this amount that is in year one. If we want to take that and turn it into an annual series, we can't just do it directly. It's going to be a two-step operation. So think about how do you turn the five million that's just in year one right now. If, if you only did a find A given P, the problem is, is it would spread it out in years two through eight and then that amount wouldn't also be distributed into year one. So it can't just be a simple find A given P. First, you would have to take it to year zero, and then you could do an A slash P with that. And then finally, think about the amount, uh, our salvage value here at year eight. So to convert that into the annual series, you've got a couple of options. You could do find a given F and so if you do find a given F then it would directly go into years one through eight and the general form of a future versus annual series is that it would also distribute into year eight so you wouldn't need any sort of secondary conversion what sometimes people would do though is they would move it from eight to zero and then from zero through eight again and that's an extra step, but sometimes people prefer to have all of the non-annual amounts at year zero combined together and then spread it out over the annual series in a single step. All right, so there are some nice advantages to the annual worth analysis, and the main one being that it is okay to compare items that have a different useful life. Normally, that's a big no-no. And that's why we use early termination, contract services, and least common multiple methods is to find some techniques to make the alternatives the same useful life. But in the case of annual worth analysis, it's already assuming that the items are going to be used for at least the LCM. So if you've got one item that's two years and another item that's three years, if you compare them by annual worth analysis, you're kind of already assuming that they would be repeated and so that you need the equipment for at least six years. Uh, the other assumption built into repeatability is just that you're assuming that the costs and the revenues would be the same in subsequent cycles. And so the cycles are happening in annual worth analysis. It's just that you don't see them and you don't have to set it up. It's just already presumed that they'll occur. Okay. Um, now, a related topic is capitalized cost analysis, and the idea here is think about if you were going to be getting $50,000 this year and for every year through infinity, not just for your life, but for the remainder of the universe, if you would get $50,000 a year perpetually, then how much would you need to have on hand now to be able to pay that out. In other words, what's the present worth of an investment that pays out forever? Well, uh, the equation for capitalized cost analysis is simply that you would divide the annual amount by the applicable interest rate. So in this case, if we said that we know the A is going to be 50000 each year, then that is essentially just the interest on the um, initial amount that was deposited. So if the interest rate that applies is 10%, for example, if we say that um, you know RMR is 10%, um, how much would you have to deposit today to make it so that you could pay out $50,000 every year forever? It seems a little bit less mysterious if you just think, all right, I would deposit 
50,000 divided by 0.1. So that means if you de deposit 500,000 and the interest rate is 10% per year, 10% of 500,000 is 50,000. So you have this initial deposit at time zero of 500,000. It gains interest during the first year. And so it accumulates 50,000 of interest. And so now you've got that 50,000 in interest, but rather than um, having compound interest, that amount gets paid out. And so it was about to be 550, but instead of the balance increasing, the interest is paid out and it, the balance stays at 500,000 for the next year. And so from year one to two, the balance of the account is 500,000. It accumulates 10% interest, so it's got another 50,000 ready to pay out. So you can just think that uh, if you know what the interest rate is, how much you can safely withdraw from an account each year and not have the balance decrease. All right, so this is called capitalized cost analysis. And um, this is just, we're making a deposit and taking the interest out indefinitely. The, uh, the real world example that sometimes this relates to is the case of permanent investments. And so I've got a picture of a bridge here as just an illustration of a uh, public works output that uh, essentially could last forever. Now, technically, I guess a bridge doesn't last forever, but in engineering economy, if something lasts for 100 years or 200 years, that's uh, nearly equivalent to perpetual. There's not much of a difference between, be, because of a very long time frame, uh, 200 years of operation and an infinite operation. So the assets have such a long life that they're considered permanent. And just in addition to bridges, it may be canals that are being dredged or uh, dams that are constructed that will have a very long lifespan. And so this is what a cash flow diagram for a permanent investment may look like. If you have to pay a lot of money up front to construct that, we may want to know what is the annual equivalent. Like if, if a bridge is going to be a, a toll bridge, if people have to pay to cross the bridge, you may ask yourself, um, how much revenue each year would you need to collect in order to justify that initial present value investment? And so if you think about what we were just looking at on the previous slide, this time we're just going to be solving for A with a known P. So it's kind of the reverse of the previous illustration. So P is known, multiply that by whatever interest rate is applicable, and then that tells you what annual amount you should recover each year. And so that's called capital recovery. You can see it in quotes there. That means that you have a capital investment, an initial outlay of funds at the present, and we want to know how much benefit or how much revenue do we need to receive in future years in order to justify that initial cost? And so you wouldn't want to build a bridge if you had a certain interest rate unless you could tell that there was going to be more value on an annual basis uh, than this P times I equivalent. Now, this is something that lasts forever. You can see on the cash flow diagram, we've got the little infinity symbol there. That means that there's no salvage value for a bridge or a dam. You know, if they need to be replaced in the future, we're just going to neglect any kind of a salvage value that, you know, the tiny residual value that there might be in recycling the steel or something like that. This is for a permanent investment that only has the initial cost. But sometimes there are items that do have a salvage value in the future. Normally it would be something that has a much shorter lifespan than a bridge or a dam. Uh, this word capital recovery can also be used in these cases where we want to account for the salvage value. And so look at what this cash flow diagram, the kind of the situation that it's describing. It's saying that you spend a lot of money at the present in order to buy or build something. And then at the end of a certain lifespan, in this case seven years, you're going to sell or dispose of the item and get a salvage value. 
And so we know a future amount and we know the present value of our cost. And the cost was an outlay. The salvage value is a revenue. And so capital recovery is the difference between the two expressed on an annual basis. And so what capital recovery accounts for is the difference between the capital cost and the salvage value. And then it's spreading the difference out over the time in between. And so to calculate the capital recovery, you would find A given P, and then you would also find A given F, and then it will be the difference between the two. And the reason why the arrow is pointing down is that it's going to cost more to obtain the item than you will get in the salvage value. That's almost going to always be the case, that when you're buying equipment, it doesn't get more valuable as you own it. That's the exception rather than the rule. Um, and so you spend a lot of money to get it. You'll receive a little bit of money when you dispose of it. And capital recovery is the difference between those two while also taking into account the interest rate that applies. And so here's the formula that you'd use to calculate the capital recovery. So there's the minus sign here for the present value because Remember, our initial outlay was a cost. And then the positive value for the salvage, because the salvage is a revenue. And what we want to do is we want to turn it into an annual equivalent. And so the annual equivalent of the present value is find A given P. And for the salvage, we want to find A given F, because it's at the end of the cash flow diagram. It's just a single future amount. We want to find the annual equivalent. So we combine both together, and then that would tell you how much revenue should you earn each year to justify purchasing this item in the first place. So the capital recovery, you can think of it as how much money your company has to make each year just to cover the equipment that you've obtained. Any questions about this idea? Do you mind showing the uh, formula one more time? Yeah. So here's the formula. The amount that's at the present we take to the annual series. The amount that's in the future, which is the salvage value, we also find A given F. With the present value, we find A given P. You are welcome. All right, so uh, today's in-class exercise, the first part is that same cash flow diagram that we were just looking at on the previous slide here. We have the, uh, the scenario here is a, a transmitter that we have purchased, and uh, it costs $8 million to purchase, $5 million to refurbish, and $900,000 each year to maintain. And then we sell it in year eight for half a million dollars. Now, in step A, what I'd like you to do, rather than you start crunching the numbers, start with the solution strategy. So think kind of like uh, in pseudocode. Just outline what are the steps that you're going to do. And so like as a bulleted point-by-point point list, rather than jumping right into the calculations, just kind of give a summary or an overview of your solution strategy. And then once you have that written out, then you can actually start using the 8% uh, table, which is here on the next page. Here's the 8% table. Let me bring it up so that we can look at both at the same time um, to find out what's the equivalent annual worth. I think it's bringing that up. There it is. All right. All right. So what we're trying to figure out here is taking all of those individual amounts to just an equivalent annual worth. But rather than jumping into the numbers first, uh, start with your solution strategy. All right. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to start thinking through this, as we always do, and then I'll jump back in and show you uh, my solution.
All right. So um, if we talk about your solution strategy, kind of the, uh, the steps that you should be thinking through to solve this one. Here's what I suggest, is that uh, you label each of the amounts that have to be converted into the annual series. And so you can see I've got arrow A was that $8 million amount that's at time zero. Then there's arrow B, that's the $5 million amount that's at year one. And then C is the salvage at year eight. And so my solution strategy is going to be that I will convert the amount A, so that's the 8 million at time zero, that'll go into an annual series by using A slash P at 8% for eight years. And then B, remember that has to be a two-step process. And so B is going to uh, go to time zero with the P slash F, so this P slash F converts the amount at time one to a lesser amount at time zero because it's going to be discounting it from the future to the present. So when I do that, I should expect that the factor is going to be less than one. And then uh, once it's at time zero, then I would use the same A slash P factor that I did with part A. And then this amount out here at time 8, I can get that to the annual series with find A given F. So this is what I mean by, you know, to outline your solution strategy is you're just saying what you're going to do before you actually do it. And I think that this is a great thing to do in exams because if you just jump straight into the calculations and then make a mistake, um, if you had outlined your strategy in advance, then I'm going to be very generous with partial credit. If I can see that you understood the big idea and you got kind of the main concept, but you just made a small calculation mistake, then you know I can just take a few peanuts off the top and it's no big deal. But if you don't give me this illustration that you understand the fundamentals, and if you just jump straight into the calculations and then uh, you make a mistake, then it's, no, it's not as obvious that you understood what was going on if you just jump straight to the calculations. All right, so here is the, uh, the 5 million I'm discounting by one year. So it takes it from year one, now it's at year zero. And then I combine it with the 8 million that was already at year zero. And so A and B combined together is going to be this 12,629,000 at time zero. And then the factor for the A slash P, that factor is 0 0.17401. So I found the annual equivalent. And then here is the annual equivalent of the future 500,000. And so now I put together all of the things that are in the annual. So I have my $47,000 is the annual equivalent of that future salvage. The 2,197,000 is the annual equivalent of A and B. And then there was already 900,000 at the uh, already in the annual. And so that's why I'm subtracting 900,000 as well. So the total annual worth is going to be $3,050,654. All right, so any questions about that? Let me zoom just so if we were to recreate this in Excel, would we just have to split it up into the ABC sections and get them? I, I can't quite hear what you're what you're asking. Could you repeat that? Yeah, can you hear me better now? I'm mostly hearing uh, echo. Yeah, one second, I'm going to plug in my mic.
All right, is that better? Yes. Awesome. Um, so if we were to recreate this in Excel, would we split the A, B, and C portions into separate sections and then um, and then have them run together so that we could get our final solution? So you're saying like have a column for the single amount at A? Yeah. Amount. I think that would be a pretty fair way to do it, yeah? Okay, and then if, if we were to do uh, this problem in Excel for an exam, would we just write out our step A, like, in the bottom of it, just have, a, like, a section where we go yeah. through our steps and how we did it? Yeah, so okay. you're, you're remembering my emphasis that you should annotate Excel uh, yeah. spreadsheets, and so I think that's a, a great idea that, you know, even when you're using Excel, you know, underneath the calculations, if you just very briefly explain what you did, then that's great value added. And so, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions related to this first problem on the in-class exercise? All right, well, let's look at this next one. All right, so if you spend $85,000 today to buy a septic pump truck, and then in six years when you're done using it, you'll have a salvage value of 18500 and let's use the same 8% interest again. And we want to know what's the capital recovery for the equipment. And so remember, the capital recovery is asking, how much revenue do you need each year just to cover the cost of the equipment? And it's not as simple as, you know, some people who didn't yet know about the time value of money, they might be tempted to say 85,000 minus 18,500 and divide by six. That would be kind of the method if there was no such thing as the interest. But what we know is that amounts at time zero and amounts at year six can't be combined together, that we have to account for the economic uh, equivalence and um, the time value of money. And so well, what I'd like you to do is put together a cash flow diagram that summarizes you know, where is the present amount and how much, where and how much is the future amount, and then what you're solving for, the unknown, is an A. So find out how much would you need each year in revenue. And so this is a problem that looks like that, very similar, slightly different because of the time frame, but put the actual amounts into your cash flow diagram and then we're solving for A. And uh, feel free to put your guess for the capital recovery into the chat box as you're working through the calculations. All right, so let me remind you of the equation that you should use in case it's not already immediately obvious. This is the equation. Let me see if I can paste it right over here. There we go. Okay, so what you need to do is uh, find the annual equivalent of the present value. And so our present amount is 85,000. And so it's saying find a given P. So here is the capital recovery column, A slash P. And this is the 8% table, which is what we're working with. And it's six years that we need to spread it out over. So n equals six. So we should use 0.21632 as our factor. And then plus the salvage value. So the salvage value is 18,500. And that's an A slash F. 
So here they call that the sinking fund column. So A slash F N equals six point one three six three two. All right. So oh that's a little too far. So first setting up the cash flow diagram. We have an outlay of 85,000, a revenue of 18,500, and we want to find out what's the annual equivalent. In other words, if you buy this truck, how much revenue do you need just to justify it? And you know, this is not an abstract concept. A lot of people buy things with the intention that they're going to start a business with it. You know, whether it's a pickup truck or maybe a big commercial lawnmower or a chainsaw, you know, you'll get some piece of equipment and you have it in your mind that you're going to use it in business. This is telling you how much do you need to generate each year in order to justify the equipment. And so here what we find is that we would need to have an annual revenue of 18 uh, of 15,865. So if we had that revenue, then it would cover this cost. And so this is negative because the equipment itself, until you get the revenue, the equipment is putting you in the hole because there's more cost than revenue. Just that single salvage value is, is going to keep it negative. And so if you want it to balance out, then the revenue amount that would balance it out would be 15865 because if you had that positive revenue, and the negative capital recovery for the equipment, then it would be balanced at zero. All right, so any questions about the second problem on here that was related to capital recovery? So would the interest rate be like for a loan, the 8%? Yep, yeah, that's one way to think about it is uh, it's your cost of capital. Uh, the other way to think about it could be in terms of opportunity cost. And so uh, it could be that it's your money, but you have lots of different things that you can do with your money. And so, you, you know, if it's your money and you're deciding to, to put it into buying this truck, um, maybe you could have done some other project that you know would have returned 8%. And so that's why you're using 8% is because of the other options that you have available. This truck has to give you at least as good a return as the other alternatives you would have selected. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Well, let me just emphasize again this formula here. That's the annual equivalent of a perpetual investment. And so that's a little bit different from what we did in this example. In this example, it wasn't perpetual. So the capital recovery for an investment that someday is going to wear, at, wear out or be sold, you would consider that single amount out in the future. But for an item that lasts forever, it's a little bit simpler. We don't have to account for a salvage value. We just say it's the present cost multiplied by the applicable interest rate. All right, so between now and Wednesday, you've got some things on your plate. You're going to finalize homework number six upload that by 11 o'clock on Wednesday and then my homework between now and Wednesday is to uh, put your exam together and try and find that perfect balance between just enough and not too much. So uh, I'll have that set up so that it is available and visible at 1030 on Wednesday and then um, it will be available for you to submit until 12.30. Now, that doesn't mean that you should still be doing calculations at 12.29. You know, think about it. It's probably going to take you a couple of minutes to scan it, to log on to Blackboard, to browse to the file location and upload it. Don't paint yourself into a corner by assuming that you have two hours to work on it. The reason why I'm giving you two hours for a 45-minute exam is so that you have plenty of time to print the exam to scan it, to upload it. Uh, it's not two hours to work and then suddenly you find yourself out of time and now you can't upload it anymore. I'll, I'll be pretty uh, merciless for people who miss that deadline. 
I hear that there was a question here. Uh, so do we have a lecture on Wednesday? No. No, you'll be taking the exam during our lecture time on Wednesday. Any other questions before we part ways for today? All right, well, thank you very much. Good luck with your studying. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And our next face, well, face to face, our next live lecture will be on Friday because of the exam Wednesday. So I will see you Friday. Take care.